Thanks for joining us this week on Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. Join your hosts, Chris Marriott and Paul Schreiner each week as they talk email marketing, life, purpose, faith, but mainly email marketing. If you're looking for some normalcy in these crazy times, you've come to the right place. Welcome to Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. We're still at home and we're still drinking coffee. My name is Paul Streiner and with me is my uh, friend and colleague. Chris Marriott. Look at that, it's so good. So good um, to be with you, Paul, as always. I, I, I treasure these moments we have together. Me too, Chris, me too, but I'm a little depressed. Why are you a little depressed, the weather? No, no, Chris. Honestly, it's a little bit darker. Here's the deal. I, uh, I'm looking for an email service provider and <laughs> I'm worried that I'm not going to get the best deal. They're, they're selling me features that I don't even know if I want. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's overwhelming. And so, yeah, I'm depressed, Chris. Paul, there's no reason to be overwhelmed. There's no reason to be concerned. Hire Email Connect and all of your worries will just magically disappear. Email Connect, that's one of our sponsors, isn't it? That is one of our sponsors. And I hear they, they manage the, uh, the, the bid of 18 to 20 billion emails a year out to bid uh, for their clients. Can you imagine the clout they must have with that kind of email volume that they're managing? Seriously, I bet you could probably get, with that kind of clout, you could probably get a better deal than anything I could do on my own. Absolutely. So again, if you're thinking RFP, let I am. Email Connect manage your next RFP. Count and, me and in, if you Chris. act right now, we'll give you two RFPs for the price of one for just additional shipping and handling. Now, I believe at one point, Chris, there was some <laughs> talk of a free hat if you were to uh, to sign up for an RFP. Is that correct? Is that still? You mean one of these hats? Oh, that's hot. That hat Look at is that. hot. I mean, that's that's primo material. Primo material, the logo, gorgeous right there in front. Yes, I mean, free hat to anyone who signs up for an RFP. This is amazing. This is honestly, you know, I came in so, so blue. And now and I'm now, feeling really, yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm ready. I want one of but you know hats. what, Paul? There, we do have another sponsor. I mean, this is beginning to sound like an infomercial for Email Connect, and I'm sure our fans aren't here to hear that. Or are no, you? they're not. They're not. They want honestly. They want to hear the guest. They want to hear about the guest. They want to hear that Audience Point is a sponsor. You know, they're and they want to hear that Listbit is an amazing product. That they're an wanting, amazing product. That they're helping brands get four hundred percent reactivation rates, and they they want to hear about all of these sort of sick and fantastic ways to use data to make their email programs better. Yeah, they want to hear that, right? But they what do. they really want is they want to hear about our guest, right? They want to hear the stories, they want to hear uh, all of the magic that our, our guests bring. And, and honestly, I think this is a pretty great one. I think it's a good one. I think there's been a lot of, uh, you know, we, we brought back in an industry expert today because there's the, again, there's continued concern over the, over the changes. The uh, Apple's been made its operating system for opens of emails. Yep. And so today we brought in somebody whose business is really built around, at least yep. as it was launched, the email open and we take them over and we ask them very pointed questions paul and i aren't pushovers we have hard hitting questions. journalists Chris. hard hitting journalists is exactly right and i think you'll enjoy today's show and you will certainly learn something for sure stick around so see you on the other side uh welcome back to email geeks at home drinking coffee uh today we have a very special guest and i just realized i've mispronounced his name for nearly 10 years Worst friend ever, uh, Vivek Sharma. Uh, I'm probably mispronouncing his last name now too, because you nailed that one. Yes! Right there, Paul. <laughs> there we go. This, this is a win for the day, right? Accuracy you know, we, is important to email geeks at home. Right. Uh, Vivek is the CEO of Movable Inc. Uh, he's been there for roughly ten years, a little bit more, out of New York City. Uh, Movable Inc. is a absolute powerhouse in the email space uh, i have 300 employees they uh are on the top of everyone's lips and honestly with everything going on with the apple mpp privacy stuff uh i think it's uh one of those groups that a lot of people are looking to to say what do we do so super glad to have you today super excited to talk with you awesome yeah it's great to be here and great to see you guys after a very long time seriously yeah, it is it's been many moons. 
But Paul, where, we where, into- where are you exactly? It looks like you're in a uh, it's my Turkish, prison Turkish prison or something. Yeah, like it that, is. That's right. Of- it's it's a, a solitary confinement. You know, the window's down. It is what it is. No, at home, at home, sneaking away. Because, I mean, we're still, we're kind of in that hybrid space still where, you know, we're a little bit in the office, a little bit at home. And there's just kids, kids underfoot. And so where can I go that's quiet? Today, it's the room. Well, and, and, and if dullness was the, was the theme you were, you were shooting for, Paul, you nailed it. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's my goal, Mira. You know, whatever I can do, whatever I can do. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, anyway, before we get into, before the fun banter gets really deep, uh, we have to do our traditional, what are you drinking? And we do, Chris. so uh, we'll start with you, Paul. Yeah, Chris, today I'm drinking uh, Mean Mug. Uh, it's a local Chattanooga coffee roaster. Uh, but you're going to think less of me because it's decaf, because we're actually filming this in the afternoon. And man, being old sucks. That's what I'm going to say. All right. Vivek. I didn't get that. So one. close, I, Marriott. I don't want to use his name. I didn't want to. I'm going to get it wrong every time. <laughs> I don't want to. Hey, you, what are you drinking? <laughs> Uh, I almost forgot about that. So I, I had my bottle next to me, but I poured it into a mug. Uh, I've got a, nice. I grabbed the kombucha in the fridge. It's a roseberry kombucha. Nice. Pro kombucha. I, I love kombucha. That's, that's my go-to in the afternoons. Totally. I was, and, and, and as Paul's already said, it's we're after, afternoon recording. So I'm not drinking my Santo Domingo coffee, though I had quite a few cups this morning. I'm reduced, uh, because of, uh, Hugh, if you're listening, uh, uh, we had Hugh. Hugh on CEO of Ugly Drinks uh, or in an earlier season. Uh, I'm on back order. I've, I've got two cases that, that have been delayed forever. So I'm actually drinking LaCroix. Ooh, <laughs> I, I just, ugly no, Hugh is not going to be happy. Ugly no. Hugh get ugly with you. Well, Hugh, please get those, get your uh, inventory backlog fixed and uh, get that uh those delicious beverages to me so i didn't realize um, you're a millennial chris here <laughs> see that's a, ah, my whole reputation <laughs> my whole I, I, you know we had lacroix around the house for <laughs> years because my wife and yeah, my stepdaughter tech, drink it. you can only text chris because he won't answer his phone that's right and even if you text right if you call me i'll be irritated with you it's like you dare call me on this phone yeah text right. me first anyway um, I could go on and on about LaCroix, but let, let, let's get back to the um, uh, well, interview. With him. There's lots, there's lots and lots and lots to talk about. And honestly, Vivek, it's been a long time. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've probably been more uh, conferency right before the, uh, before COVID, before the pandemic hit, but uh, I think you kind of stopped coming. You have people that go to them now. Is that right? <laughs> I, yeah, I think I was, I was on the road a lot and, uh, I had kids I wasn't seeing a whole lot. And, uh, it turns out my, my team is awesome and yep. it was a chance to, uh, get them out there. And so, yeah, the early years I was doing the circuit and, you know, do the conference, do the pub after hang out with you guys. Right. And, uh, you know, since then, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a few years since I've been out there and, you know, if I'm presenting, I'll, par- I'll, pr- I'll probably go, but we've, we've had a great team. So probably Allison or Adam or others on, on our team, you've, you've seen out there a little bit more. Sure. Sure. Well, and, and, uh, so glad to have you on, get to reconnect. I guess that's where I'd say, um, I know that, uh, people who are listening, watching, uh, participating, uh, I mean, movable link is a, is a, is a giant in the industry. And that's not, that's not to sort of blow, uh, smoke, uh, at you but more to say i think i think because of that i think there's a lot of people that want to hear your perspective on what's going on with with apple uh with the pixel we could get into the technical detail i'm guessing most folks who are probably participating in this uh episode kind of have a general gist the what's going on is apple is sort of pre-fetching pixels uh on their on their iphone device when you're using uh, iOS and um, there's still a lot of sort of secrecy around it because they didn't really publish anything like hey here's how this works it's been a lot of just observation and a lot of sort of like discovery and reaction response so why don't we just start with 
love to hear your your take on this. Vivek? Well, and, let, let me jump in there. And, and Paul, nice going right to the, uh, I, I thought we were going to, you know, gradually get to the meat. Uh, way to and, take the focus off, and, Chris. We're, and we're hard about, hitting journalists. And, well, well, hard hitting you are. And, well, and, and I think the key question here is, is if your platform, and, and you were the leader, you were the first one groundbreaking before anyone thought about it, 2010. I, I, I used to call it adaptive content or open time optimization is now I think the, the fancy term people use. And, and you were a great example of innovation being brought into the email marketing industry by third party vendors yeah, yeah, yeah. well ahead. And, and in fact, I still don't think there's a email platform that has a native version of open time. Uh, I was talking to a platform today and we were trying to figure out if there was one. I think I think oh, sale yeah. through and live clicker come closest with their integration. They're both owned by CM Group. But I, even to this day, I don't think there's other than that example, there is a, a platform that has natively built what you do. And I think yeah. that's that's amazing and, and a testament to your technology. But all of that being said, the technology is has always been based upon the idea of again open time optimization uh, of that image or that content. And to Paul's, you know, Paul talking about Apple, if we don't, if, if opens no longer are, are at the time of, or, or if, if everything's open at the same time, because that's when Apple caches it. And so you don't really know when somebody opens their email, how do you continue to deliver the, the, the core thing you've delivered for 11 years, 10 plus years, which is optimization at open. I mean, that's the thing I've been wondering ever since I heard. Yeah. So um, maybe I'll back up a little bit. So 10 and a half years ago, I co-founded this company with this uh, guy named Michael Nutt. Uh, I'm a former engineer. I built e-commerce systems, but mar marketing technology, I, I think I touched on it. In fact, uh, I was in a company called Blue Martini Software. Everyone's familiar with like Salesforce Journey Builder. We, we had built something like that back in like 2000 and 2001. Uh, I think we called it like multi-stage campaigns or dialogue dialogue management. Uh, so, um, start of the company, the the observation was, um, you know, if you're not familiar with Move Link, basically companies have made huge investments in data, uh, but what they struggle with is still to engage with their customers. And so, where Move Link comes in is to help these large businesses, or rather innovative businesses take their great data assets and translate them into personalized content that gets people to act, to either yep. to click or to convert or take some form of action. And, um, and that's at a high level, but the devil's in the details. And so 10 years ago, when we started the company, we observed that the ESPs were pretty good at doing message deployment and orchestration. They were doing the segmentation. But uh, even if there were like multi-stage campaigns, the, the, the content was the bottleneck. There was a real problem because a lot of people got very generic, got the same content. Uh, and the, the production was just, the production costs were very high for, for building this. So our innovation, uh, it was a, uh, me and my co-founder were, were, you know, he's far more technical than me, but uh, the initial idea, and we were not email marketers when we started the company. So there's a lot we didn't know. Right. Uh, the initial idea was, hey, there's a technical innovation we came up with that can change imagery inside an email at the moment of open. And we kind of dug in a little bit further and said, what data points do you have at the mo moment of open that a marketer probably doesn't have access to? And right. so open time is of course one thing, you can detect the device using user agent, you've got the IP address and you can do geolocation off of that and weather and stuff like that. And that, that was the original idea. And uh, we went out there and pitched customers and you know, still took a couple of years for, for companies to wrap their head around it. And it's funny now, but like eight or nine years ago, we often were asked, how much really changes between when an email gets sent and when right. it gets opened that why would anyone even want this? Because, you know, within the two hours, three hours, you're telling me things are that drastically different. Yep. And um, it, it, we didn't have as clear an answer for that back then. Right. Yeah. Uh, there, there were some use cases that weren't about the time. At the time, it was about other factors that you couldn't sure. know. But what turned out to happen was uh, a few years into it, our best customers were saying, yeah, yeah, this stuff is fine. The real-time data points are fine. But you know, we have this, uh, I guess they weren't calling it a CDP back then, whether it was a CRM or a customer data platform, or uh, we've got this pricing engine, or we've got this API over here. Uh, could you plug into this and help drive? Because that's way more strategic for us. Like the bells and whistles, this kind of stuff is cute. It's, it's fun. And we'll, we'll use it for some campaigns. 
But the real value is in taking these data sources that we have that help drive key strategic initiatives for our business. And I won't say the light bulb went off right away for us. We still had this thing that we were trying to be different and, and pitch this idea of real-time data points. But eventually, it became so obvious that our customers wanted us to do this and say, plug in all the stuff we've already invested in. We already have this great data. We've got a loyalty system. We've got a pricing engine. Uh, we're using CrowdQuist to, to do uh, uh, loyalty, or we're using uh, Curalate for social data. So we've already made these investments. Don't try to come up with something cute or add sizzle to the email. I mean, we'll do some of that. But help us drive, help us drive our campaigns. And Five years ago, that's what we ended up focusing on. A few years back, we formalized it. We called the Movable Ink Exchange, exchange.movableink.com. And uh, I believe this podcast is going to be live like maybe mid or late next week. So, so if you go to movableink.com. Producer David gets on the stick. Yeah, it will be. Yeah. Well, uh, so you will see if you go to our website, uh, it took us far too long to update it. Things that were already in motion. Um, this is the thing that we've been communicating to the market plug into the exchange, use integrations, use your zero and first party data in more meaningful ways. And if you go to our website now, uh, you'll see uh, two things. One, that there's been a brand evolution uh, and, and oh. some things we're pretty excited about. And, and two, a lot more of this data, uh, the this, this story around data activation and zero and first party data comes through. And this is stuff we've been working on for years now, but uh, people, get, uh, people end up focusing and want to talk about countdown timers. Yep. Well, so. but it's more than that, right? I mean, to to and and I I understand the position movable links in because we're not that far off at audience point, right? Um, like you'll like what you need to do is focus here. Let's focus on the things that we have, not on the things that we're losing. So that's not that not that's not lost on me at all. I guess I'd say it's more than just countdown timers, though, because you know I think the your technology has evolved in a lot of ways to like real-time package tracking, right? Things that, that or, you know, tied in into your inventory for pricing. So when you open the email, it says, you know, hey, save 20% on your thing. And here's, here's how much inventory is there right now. I mean, that's got to have an impact. Will it not? Yeah, so uh, even um, the countdown timer thing, it's not just that we want to talk about. We've, we've uh, a lot of these real-time, um, elements that we call them contextual elements that you talk about. We, um, it's funny because we've tried to move the conversation over to the, these other topics for years now. Right. And uh, it, there's almost an eye roll moment that happens with uh, some of our client services team when someone's like, that's cool, but um, you know, perhaps not as sophisticated a client, but I want to put a timer in my email. Right. And it's right. like, ah, we, we know how this is going to play out. We've done this a thousand times. We're going to come back here three months, six months from now. Uh, the results won't be there, and we wish we would have had the fundamental. And so, in fact, we're, we're, we've been screening our clients and helping them build what we call sophisticated use cases for, for a few years and saying, we're not going to do that thing. Maybe we'll do it, but we've got to focus on the things that drive your business. Now, to your other point, yes, it's not just about countdown timers. Uh, you mentioned the inventory data, or I've yeah. got package tracking, and there's information here. Lots of amazing stuff. Yeah. So uh, one of the first things we did is review a lot of the APIs that drive the use cases. And as it turns out, although an API can be called real time, what happens, the data that sits behind the scenes is usually not real time. It's and true. I'll give you an example. There's a large financial services firm that builds a completely personalized list of offers for every single individual. And, we, and this, this is very central to their marketing. And we figured, well, there must be impact here, right? There's kind of a triage, like which, which use cases are really impacted? And as it turns out, that updates once a day, right? Every 24 right. hours. Uh, inventory levels aren't down to the number. Uh, rarely do you, do you find that. There, there are batch updates yeah. that happen in backend systems and things like that. So you'd be surprised. You think there's a kind of a real-time component to a lot of these, but the reality is the data is the stuff behind the scenes that isn't quite there. And the question to ask is, really, really, what the at the heart of it, this is, how easily can you access all the different data sources that sit around your business? Uh, can you compose them and uh, generate content that is unique? Uh, can you make the workflow super simple? So something that might have taken, you know, the the, the planning cycle used to take right. weeks and months in advance, all right? If you think about what the the level of work that goes into an email campaign, so comparing that with uh, how much effort and 
post send, you eliminate the weeks and months. This is completely built to be automated and post send it generates at, at, at some point. Uh, right. And some of the data we're seeing indicates it's actually a little bit closer to the time that people open it than one might think. Yeah, we, I mean, the stuff we've done recently, research we're seeing, like we, we, we sent a batch test campaign out. We saw the prefetch two hours after the send, right? And then again, 26 hours later. So there's still a lot of questions ar around this whole tech. So what's, what, what we know today is gonna change tomorrow. But here, may, I'm, I'm just a simple suburban boy, but help me understand what, and, 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 I, and I, get what you're, I get what you're saying in terms of APIs and, and real-time data and, and, and accessing all these data sources. Uh, and, and I agree, that's great stuff. But how, in a world where, nevertheless, they're all going to get the same content it's no longer when they open it, it's when it was cached. How is that real-time data that, that you're serving up different from one of the more advanced DSPs that can actually use APIs at time, at time and build, yeah. pull in last minute content? Yeah. It, do, it, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of difference between that one last- serving minute. serving HTML, one serving as a pain, right? Yeah. Um, uh, we, yeah, well, we had this yeah, conversation, I mean, I mean, the same kind of thing eight years ago, uh, which we heard, hey, we do dynamic content. We can put the merge tags into, um, you know, into generate the HTML. And uh, it, it turns out a lot of the type of content that is effective, you could do merge tags eight years ago, you can do it today, right? And whatever data that sits behind that merge tag works. Uh, the question is, is that the best way to communicate to a customer? And in some cases, yes. In many cases that uh, we work with our customers, the, the visual element and being able to generate something that you simply can't do in text form yeah. is what is appealing, right? You can, you can make a marketing message if you think about any ad you've seen or, you know, text alone isn't sufficient. Maybe if you're running like Google text ads, but the generation of visual content of creative is something that is fundamentally um, important. It has an impact. It has a performance impact and it yeah. isn't something um, that any ESP, and I'll, I'll tell you, they, many have tried uh, sure. to pull off. Um, but <laughs> that is but, a story for beers someday, by the way. <laughs> yes, I've seen screenshots of uh, of attempts at this. Oh. Uh, but but one of the things I've learned is, uh, especially like our, our technical team, uh, every difficulty, every pain point that they've gone through of of scale and of uh, performance, uh, I've, I've I've told the team be be very happy about this because. This stuff isn't easy to pull off, right. and uh, anyone else attempting to kind of do this has to has to face the same thing. Right. So I think what's important here is what is going to make the the customer, the, your consumer, act and react, and what are the use cases that really support that. And it's a good thing if uh, if there are there are more there's more choices that marketers have to be able to accomplish that. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're the ones leading the way right now. And we're not standing still. So just to give you an example, email is still really important. Uh, but there are other channels that visual right. content is equally important. So mobile, I'll give you an example. You know, just last year, we, um, we launched into mobile. So mobile push notifications could, be, could have rich creative inside yeah. it. In mobile app content, could, uh, and there's a message inbox. Yep. And uh, our mobile business has taken off. It's a multi-million dollar business, and it was just launched last April. So you're starting to th see an approach from marketers that is not as channel centric or more yep. customer centric. And when you think about all the different data that sits in different places, the difficulty in assembling it, generating a perfect piece of unique content for the individual and have it be consistent across any channel that the customer is choosing to interact. Uh, that's, that's a tough problem. And that's one that we think is a, is a big opportunity to solve. Do you think, do you think that this, the MPP stuff with Apple, do you think that, that benefits uh, subscribers, email recipients. Like, do you think that's to their to their benefit? I, I understand, and I'm not in opposition with uh, why Apple is doing this. And you know, seven or eight years ago, if you can recall, Google and um, you know Google did this, and at I least remember. Apple is giving a warning oh, to the we industry. We were so mad. We were so mad. I, I don't. I remember. No, <laughs> no, nah, Google. We lost our Pixel, right? Yeah, well, it wasn't, you didn't know what was happening. 
So right, there was no blog post. The blog post came out after a change was rolled out, and this is after uh, it was after Black Friday, like a week after Black Friday or something like that. And suddenly things are breaking, and you're not sure why. Yeah. And so, um, you were yeah, really and, switching and, on that. You were uh, kind of what I what I heard you say was, I mean, I'm not against it, uh, and I think that's kind of the public stance we all have to take, right? Like, I'm not against this. I think digital security is a good thing. But do you, I guess the underlying question is, do you think it benefits customers? So I'm fully, I'm fully in the boat of privacy and security being right. important things. And I think of this not only as a, uh, a marketing technology uh, creator, but for marketers and even as a consumer, right? Yeah. I have young kids. I think about all the, you know, I, I got off Facebook uh, a, a while back. Yep. So th there is a legitimate concern about information being collected and what, what people have access to. And GDPR is a good thing, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the execution of it is the question, you know, how are people right. accomplishing this? And is this the best way? And uh, we just ran a, a survey recently uh, uh, of over a thousand consumers. So it's funny, people really care about privacy, but they really want personalization. As weird, well. isn't it? I yeah. mean, there's this weird, <laughs> wait, you mean I can't have both? Yeah. So th this is the thing, the paradox that every business is going to have to think through. Um, you know, 61% of uh, consumers said they were more likely to buy goods from, uh, from a company that is tailored to them. Uh, many of them say that, you know, brands lost trust when they, they were just showing irrelevant sorts of things. So there, there is this, um, there's this contradiction, but it doesn't have to be. You know, it just pushes us to think harder of how can we meet our privacy goals? How can we keep information really secure and uh, risk-free and you don't expose people to, to uh, cyber attacks and things like that? And how do you get them as tailored and experienced as you possibly can? And so, that's why we, we lean into first and zero party, data, having that earned by businesses, yeah. uh, either shared explicitly or implicitly, and to think about how can you build your visual content using those data points, right. and that is going to have a transformative impact for every marketing department. So, um, yeah, and I, I, again, I think great answer. Um, I, I think that that duality of, um, so, uh, of sort of wanting digital security uh, and being being advocates for it, but again, at the end of the day, the folks that we represent, the marketers, they're being gauged uh, based on the revenues that they're generating, right? And as much as it's really nice to sit back and go, man, we're 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 you know we're we're protecting the data for our customers, you know, when people lose jobs because you know revenue's not flowing as much. It gets real, right? And uh, and so, um, kind of, I guess wh where I'd like to take us is is not necessarily so much that, but sort of uh, into that a little bit more, which is um, who's speaking for the marketers now? You know, yeah, in, so in that, in that, in that, because it, at the same time, right? I think there's a couple of natural conclusions here, right? Either a People are just going to kind of lean into it and be like, we're going to get smarter. And, and they will, right? They will. They'll get smarter and they'll come up with new ways to use movable ink to drive and sell more product. But I also think what I see often happening is people just hit the send button more, right? They're just going to hit send, 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 and it's going to drive, drive fatigue. Yeah. Look, uh, the, the email space, it's an illusion that it's been the same for the last 20 years. We've seen this right. change from uh, text to digital to um, you know, images not being enabled and then suddenly being turned on. Uh, you know, every step of the way, there's been deliverability, how, how that works, and having to talk to the different ISPs and then weighing engagement instead as a way to factor that. Every step of the way in the last 20 years, email has evolved and marketers have evolved. And if anything, I, I think we've, we've gotten better for it. Things yeah. have gotten more personalized. Um, we're probably the more, most mature of any channel, every, any direct response channel to consumers yeah. in the protections and the, the kinds of things that happen. So this is a good thing. And I think this is good for the long-term health of email as a channel. That said, uh, and, and yes, all for privacy and security, 
and we have to help marketers find a way to still communicate the best attributes of the product, create something awesome, and help them tell their story effectively to every individual uniquely. Right. Um, that said, I am concerned that we have you know kind of a duopoly here. Uh, yeah. Google and Apple email is supposed to be an open protocol. Right. It is you know protocol level. It's supposed to work a certain way. And you know, kind of like the browser wars back in the '90s, where Netscape was doing a thing and IE was doing a thing, and they were breaking from standards. It yeah. worries me that a couple of companies have undue control and influence, and um, we we should be a little bit concerned about that, about open protocols uh, falling and walled gardens. I, I appreciate some of the things that are happening. I understand it's a challenge for marketers. I think we'll be better for it, and I'm concerned about uh, big tech at all yeah. at the same time. Right. And, and that's, that's where I was hoping you would go. And Chris, I'm sorry, I'm totally hogging the conversation. Chris is like, damn it, Paul. But no, uh, the, I mean, I was kind of hoping you would go there because it's not as simple as we like to state. You know, let's just be more secure. I, I really do think that you're right. There is this duopoly, duopoly, whatever, <laughs> uh, where big tech is like now we're giving all of our data to, to Google and Apple, period, right? And we'll, let's just hope that they're secure with our data. I, I don't think that's better. Um, so, Movalink, you guys, uh, again, you're a, a big player in the in the sort of non ESP. I, in fact, I'd say the biggest player in the not an ESP email space. You think that's fair, Chris? Uh, you know, I could I could toss validity potentially into that mix. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would too. I would too. Tomatoes, but again, tomatoes. But hand handful of big, big ones. So I'm curious. Have you guys had conversations with Apple? I would guess you guys more so than you know, Audience Point or Email Connect could have a seat at that table with them. Have you guys reached out to them? We have not reached out to Apple. Um, I will say, years ago, we and we were a much smaller company back then. Uh, when in 2013. We reached out to Google. Uh, this is like funny. Uh, a lot of the ESPs I talked to were like, uh, "Google's not going to listen to you." They, you know, right. they, they they've got this kind of uh, opinion of things. And you know, uh, a, a few months of searching, even finding the product manager responsible for Gmail uh, was a challenge. So we found the person at Gmail. We found the person at Yahoo. Yep. Um, we and and what they had done was kind of broken. It was a very poor implementation. Again, some of the same conversation that's happening now. Google had gone okay. through and they were trying to protect privacy and security. They were caching things, proxying images, masking IP address, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Uh, unfortunately, there was like a global cache and that, that it implemented. There's these unintended consequences, right? Yeah. There's a giant battleship here, uh, not understanding all, all, all the little boats in its wake. And so we had a conversation and uh, what, I, what I joke as the ugliest pitch deck you have ever seen, intentionally so, because we didn't want to, we didn't want to seem like we were pitching Google. We just wanted to lay out. Yeah, like, here hey, is the the better consumer the experience. This is what's breaking. I get what you're saying about the um, uh, kind of protecting privacy, and here's a potential solution for it. And uh, this cache override uh, thing, this no cache header. And um, I think it was like a month or two of radio silence. Uh, I joined Mog, and then yeah. I I went out to 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 the Bay Area and met up with. Um, the, the product manager and he was like, oh yeah, what you were telling me kind of made sense and we implemented it. it. The change should already be out, you know, in the next week or so, the change is going to be out to, to fix that. Mm -hmm. And Yahoo, similar type of conversation, yeah. both of those followed suit and it was a good conversation um, that we had. Uh, Apple, I, I wouldn't put, uh, for, for anyone out there, I wouldn't put our eggs into the Apple basket. Right. Uh, Apple has a very different point of view. They are, uh, privacy is one of their core features. Right. And um, they, they don't have a business. They don't understand the email business, the ad business. You know, they're an email client. By the way, uh, another little thing, they're the default email client on every single app. They own the platform and the app, uh, yeah. which is an interesting subject of conversation uh, right now in, in Congress. So um, that's always uh, been, know. I mean, that, that's been Apple's gig. Everybody criticized them in the 90s because Microsoft said, we're a software company. We'll let someone else build the hardware. Windows and Apple Explorer. always said, no, we're, a, we're, we're not going to license our, I mean, they tried to license their, their, I think for a short period of time, license their software, but they, they said, no, we're going to be hardware and software. And, and, and yet here they are, to, as you were just saying, as I cut you off, 25 years later, still 
the hardware and the software all in one. And that's, right. that's still pretty much unique to, to Apple. That's always been their sort of MO. Yeah. It, the, the question is, at the size Apple is, I forget how many trillion dollar, you know, one, two trillion dollars in market cap. Uh, you know, if you're Spotify, you have issues with the special access that, uh, that, they, that they've been given. If you're Sonos, you know, I've got these Sonos systems. It doesn't, it's not as smoothly integrated. You don't have the APIs to make it work the same yep. way. Those tile trackers, now that Apple tag uh, is out, you know, a- Apple has a history of giving themselves kind of a VIP lane and doing yep. that hardware software integration and not making it an even playing field. Yep. So, you know, your guess is as good as mine about how this is going to play out. Um, but yes, yeah, so for the, for the long term, this is the reality, right? I, I think we should accept it. And I, 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 I sincerely say this because this is not uh, a new strategy like, oh, no, here's the Apple changes. Oh, no, we've got to like throw out our strategy yeah. playbooks. Uh, everyone had that one moment of like, oh, man, what, is, what does this mean? And is this a pretty destructive thing? And what we found out is going through the full list, I'll give you a couple of stats. Um, we reviewed, I think, 300 billion impressions we served in the first half of the year. Yep. Uh, 0.2% of them were countdown timers. 0.6% were uh, using a IP-based geotargeting sure. rule rather than that people use like on-file stuff. Uh, 4.6% were using a device targeting rule, which by the way is, is still possible. Sure. And, and uh, the number of hours seemed to be immaterial. You know, we probably only got, it's a very small number of companies we've talked to, lots of questions, but n- no one's changing their strategy right, right. now. Especially when you think about the broader ecosystem, uh, if you're if you're playing an ad tech and you know the new requirements and things happening with third party cookies, and things are drying up, like you, you've got to step back and look at it as a CMO of a company. Right. Where are you going to invest those dollars that is going to get you the most bang for the buck? Uh, is it the ad ecosystem? Is it um, share cropping in somebody's walled garden like Facebook and Instagram? You know how long right. do you think you can pull that off? Or is it an owned and operated channel where you have a direct line to your customers, things like your website, email, and your mobile app. And where better to invest than your data assets, taking these things that you haven't been using as effectively and turning them into personalized content and marketing very effectively to your customers. So it, it is always important to take a step back and look at what is happening in the broader ecosystem. And what, you know, how does that affect how an email marketer should think or where this industry is going. Well, and I agree with you. Like this is coming, right? Like we're, uh, this is coming. I did. I, I was curious because when I say, you know, have you reached out to Apple? I don't, I just mean not Vivek or even move link, but like you represent a lot of investors, funds, sort of bigger, much bigger. The circle gets drawn a lot bigger than just movable ink who want to see your success happen. And, and so that's where I was kind of going was like, uh, I do think from a lobbying perspective or not even lobbying, cause that feels more governmental, but just from the whole uh, sort of making connections, there's got to be, I, I think that's one of those things that we're missing in our industry a little bit is sort of that, that sort of industry group that says, Hey, we have enough clout that when we call, you'll take the call. And, and, you know, that's something yeah. I feel like we're missing. Uh, look, I, I would not want to back with the Google changes and everything. I, we understood what they were trying to do and we could conceive a technical solution that yeah. met their requirements while building a better consumer experience. It is not obvious what that is with Apple, right? Right. So, no, and I totally this, agree. This, is, this is the thing that said, I think it's always a good idea to uh, build relationships with the big players in the industry. And I think we forget this sometimes, right? Uh, there is, uh, by the way, uh, change happening in industries. It, it isn't just smaller companies or mid-sized companies right. that this happens to. Uh, you know, if you're Apple right now, your depends, dependency on manufacturing being all in China is, is a big deal. If you're yep. Facebook right now, the changes Apple has made to app tracking and everything is going to be very consequential. If you're Tesla, yep. uh, the, the scarceness of electricity to drive your car is suddenly, like every company goes through uh, yep. these major changes and that's the nature of technology. So I think that the point is that all of tech is waking up that you can't just exist in a little bubble yep. and you have to be aware and you have to start to build those relationships before big changes happen right. to have conversations and um, 
at least exchange ideas. Because then it's too late. It's too late. Yes. Once you know, once you've got that electricity shortage. <laughs> hey, uh... you know, I want to go back to you know saying you know we don't blame Apple for what they're doing. I blame them. I think it stinks. I don't. I don't think. I think if you ask ninety nine out of a hundred consumers, do you care if a, if somebody knows when you've opened an email? They'd say what? No. <laughs> Yeah, of course not. Well, what do I care? That, that that's meaningless data. Um, so there certainly weren't consumers weren't clamoring for it, and in fact, they weren't even aware that that was being tracked. So, uh, again, uh, I give a a a Apple uh, rotten tomatoes for that. I think that's just virtue signaling, virtue born, making a deal out of something because they're, as you said, their their brand is built around privacy, and they'll make up privacy issues when they don't have a legitimate one to yeah. to sell. But I want to get back to, I keep coming back to, so that I, I understand what, what that your value proposition in the age of not being able to track literal open time is from, if I'm understanding what, you're, what, you're, what you've been telling us is that the last best opportunity for real-time optimization is still offered by movable ink because that optimization occurs at or shortly after the, I, I, as the email is shot into space, the optimization is, is happening between being shot into space and some point down the road of either a machine opening and caching it right. or the consumer opening it. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. If, if, you, if you think about uh, the, the shot into space analogy, you know, the space shuttle, the supply chain, the months and, you know, year it yeah. takes to build that thing after the thing's been launched for constructing something kind of really important that the, cu the, the customer should see. And in terms of data points, there's probably 500 data points every co uh, company has. Um, the, 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 the time that something is opened or um, you know, the IP address, when pale in comparison to all of these other things that are more fundamentally driving their business. Yep. And that's right. the big thing. It's the shiny thing to, oh, real time, it looks like it changed. But if you really get into what drives impact, what has meaning, what is going to move the needle for your business? It's, you know, it's it's these data sources, all the all the things that we're plugging into in the into the movable link exchange and the uh, the assembly of it, the construction, yep. the personalization, the million unique pieces for a million unique people. Uh, that's the hard part, and the thing that uh, marketers are passionate about have and have seen real value driven from. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, I think everybody wants that just sort of add water stir, right? Like, I don't want to do the hard work of marketing. I just want money's coming in. I mean, that's what we all want, right? And you're saying the hard work's still there. That's it, that this, in fact, anything it exposes that need more. Yeah. I mean, if anything, um, I, I think it's important for email marketers to think not just about changes like this, but how is consumer behavior changing, right? I know we keep, you know, people keep saying email is going to die, email is going to, and that hasn't happened. But uh, the, the rate at which new technologies are coming out, right? right. If, if we're wearing augmented reality glasses yeah. or uh, we are, um, you know, audio kind of interfaces, like there's a lot of new things that are happening that are still incredibly important. And I, I think it behooves email marketers to think about where things are headed and not just assume the next well, 10 years will look like the last 10. Well, part of the problem, Vivek, and I'm curious your take on this is, there is a bit of, you know, because it's open standards and we all have these email clients based on HTML 3.2, innovation in this space has been very, very difficult, right? Because, you know, hey, you can slice up your images, you can put in dynamic content. Um, you know, you want something super interactive. You've got to learn everything there is to know about CSS and hope that the browsers don't change a bit because it's going gonna, it's gonna to break eventually, right? So, and the cost of put sort of that dynamic stuff together. We've tried launching things like AMP for email and different sort of uh, um, technologies. But, you know, to your point, things, things have changed substantially, but I might also counter argue that and say, but they haven't, right? I feel like if you look at sort of the security of email, it's still atrocious, like that hasn't improved, right? Like uh, you can tra trace out routes and, and monitor email because it's not being sent on secure channels, right? Um, uh, to everything from like, we can't really do anything cool and dynamic in email or as much as we'd like to. When does that change? When do we get 
the 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 male clients to open that up a little bit. Yeah, so I I think there's some level of a a platform, you know, the platform terms like overused, but there's a benefit to having some some things not change all the time, right? Yeah, HTTP is a protocol, how yep. hyperlinks work, how uh, SMTP, how email protocols work. Uh, then you can have innovation. You're not, you don't have shifting sands under yep. you. And then there's maybe the next level of pl platform, almost almost a, the infrastructure layer, the, then the platform layer, then the application layer. Um, and so, you know, sometimes those things have to be revisited. I, I almost think like, let, let the old platform be, because it's really hard to backfill changes and, and make neat things happen and like fix for every edge case and every single yeah. thing that's going to happen out there. And, you know, perhaps invent a new thing. That Email 2.0. Yeah, whatever messaging 2.0, you know, maybe it doesn't look the same as if you could reinvent a, a new foundation today, what would it look like? How do people move between devices and places and, uh, you know, form formats? Like it, it would look quite different, I think, than the past. Well, I did notice on your LinkedIn profile, one of the things it said was Vivek knows about web 2.0. And I was like, ah! oh man, I can't believe that's still, that's, that's, that's embarrassing. Glad. glad to know that, you know. <laughs> I wanted to talk, you, you gave a recent interview in Media Post, and you were talking about something that I think we don't acknowledge enough. And you also earlier were talking about first party data, which is things I tell you. Oh, no, zero party data, which is things I actually tell you. First party data are things I've done with you, and uh, whether it's browsing or, or purchases. And you talked about shifting communication strategy to turn new customers into loyalists. And I interpreted that as, as, as you know, building more robust loyalty programs. And, and I think because loyalty programs are a treasure trove of yeah. zero and first party data. I mean, it just comes, it's a gusher. And I think that, you know, what, 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 what I'm waiting to see is, is the vendor landscape and our landscape, you know, where are the loyalty programs? Where are they? Where, you know, there's loyalty vendors all over the map. You got loyalty 360 is, is a whole, uh, yeah. advocacy group or, or industry group related to loyalty companies, but there really is not an overlap yet in, the, yeah. in between loyalty providers and email providers other than loyalty providers use email. But I'm saying ESPs and other players in ours, do you see that? Because, I mean, is that something you, you, you feel is missing as well? And is it something you see changing or, or having to change? Yeah. Um... So our, our, our view of the marketing world, there are systems that manage data for a company, and that could be loyalty data, that could be pricing data, that could be yeah. all sorts of different things. There's systems that do messaging and orchestration, and those are, you know, whether you're talking about Salesforce Marketing Cloud or, you know, Braze for mobile marketing uh, yep. and, um, you know, very channel specific. Uh, there are systems that manage static content, you know, here's just my, where my assets but to try to pull all of that together and deliver the right message, right time, all that stuff that we, that we always say, um, you know, that, that, that is still a challenge for companies and it's hard to do everything. So, um, we, you know, we've kind of made it our mission to assemble the content, be the best in the world at generating personalized content with data that sits anywhere, uh, sitting inside any marketing channel, working with any provider that you, you choose uh, and, and accessing that. Uh, content from whatever CMS or repository or it's uploaded to your own website. So that, that's the kind of thing we're, uh, we're doing. But uh, loyalty has been, loyalty programs are a big part of what we do with many of our clients. So that's just one think, of the yeah. strategies. Um, give you an example, um, you know, kind of post COVID or I'll give you one for a few different industries. Um, for retail, some of our customers realize, you know, during COVID, there's, you know, kind of a time of great change. There's a lot that has to happen with their email. You know, suddenly everything's being re reinvented, right? The rules right. of how you're running your email program. So they created modules to drive people to local stores via the zip code that, that they already had on file. Uh, and uh, it supported a buy online, pick up in store strategy. There was loyalty program information. And so we could quickly connect, you know, what tier you're in, how many points and how it could be spent towards the thing and uh, show you in stock uh, personalized inventory recommendations as well. So lots of different types of data sources and vendors, right? It's a use case, it's a marketing strategy, but they had to pull from several different types of things in order to deploy that. Um, same with uh, travel and uh, financial services. 
uh, they're doing elaborate data visualizations of uh, first party data, what they know, the journey with the brand and what they would uh, like to accomplish. And uh, you know, one one on one, they're doing year in review storyboards showing travel milestones over the last yep. year, or uh, what's your loyalty anniversary with with the, with the brand, and how do you uh, how have you gotten value over the years with, with with this brand? So that that becomes a really interesting and intriguing part of any conversation where a marketer can suddenly think more openly of, uh, hey, here's what I'm trying to accomplish this year. Right. These, these are my strategic initiatives. Here's a bunch of the the, the data the technologies I've acquired sit with us and let's brainstorm together about how we can get the most and think about think about what our customers want to see from us and how we can just be helpful you know even if it isn't to drive a purchase in every single email so and here's i think i think chris thanks for bringing this up uh i think what's cool about the concept of a loyalty program um versus uh subscriber revenue uh, I mean, both accomplish the same thing, right? Email is a relational channel. I have a relationship with you. I sent you email. You know my brand. There's a brand story, brand relationship, all of that stuff, right? And that's fantastic. But I think because we're so driven by revenue as an industry that we lose track of this idea that this is a relationship. And the idea that we'd have a loyalty program, and instead of it being like, how much money can I squeeze out of you, Marriott? I look at you and I say, I want to celebrate our relationship and I want to build that loyalty, right? Where that's the focus and the emphasis. And, and instead of it sort of water, you know, what water falls out of that loyalty is I'm going to buy your product. I'm going to be your brand champion. Like uh, all I drink is mean mug, right? Because that's, you know, what, whatever it is. But the, the point is, I think that's the beautiful thing about the email channel that I think a lot of us are missing when we're just driving bottom line, bottom line, bottom line. Yeah. Lifetime value. Yeah. Right. right. So th there can be metrics. There can be other ways, you know, people don't like the, just the soft and fuzzy. I'm just doing things to do things, but the uh, financial return on every email send shouldn't be the only thing that you're focused on. And right. it's very easy to get fall into that trap of like quarterly goals. And what do I have to accomplish? But we have to think about the, the long term because if someone checks out, if they, disengage with you, they go shop elsewhere. Um, that, that, that's a big loss. And there's a lot of fast, you know, D to C brands. There's, there's a lot of really savvy companies coming up that really get this and, um, mm -hmm. you know, are, are doing things the right way. And it's, it's important to pause and make sure we're, we're just help being helpful and creating value for our, for our customers too. Sure. 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 Yep. Um, so, uh, other questions, I know we're probably running near the end of time here with you. So I want to make sure that Chris, I've occupied your time substantially where I, I over your tech Chris. geek. I know you get, I know you get very excited. Honestly, when we can start nerding out, that's where I, my jam just, I show up. I'm like, this it's time. Paul's gotten bored in that jail cell. You know, he's been looking to talk to people and anything, so. honestly, <laughs> exactly. anything. We, we get a, an hour in the yard every day and that's it. Uh, you know, again, I just, I just, you know, I think it's, you know, the people who drive innovation and I got a lot of friends at vendors um, and a lot of product teams at vendors. And what I've seen is that a lot of the innovation in our industry and you guys were a first mover, not the first mover, maybe, but a, a, a first mover, I, we've seen a greater proliferation of, of it in the last 10 years, but innovation in the, our industry still comes from third scrappy third parties who, who focus on one feature or function and, and deliver it and integrate it. And, and you know, eventually I've, I've seen in a lot of cases, either the ESPs then develop native capabilities or they buy and integrate yeah. uh, these third parties. And, and you know, I think your contribution uh, just as, 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 you know, demonstrating that yeah. You know, innovation can happen in third parties, is happening in third parties, and is important. You know, there isn't an RFP that, that I issue or requirements document that I issue where your name isn't in it. Not, not yeah. your name, but your company's name isn't in it. Can you do adaptive content, which is what I've been calling it now, I understand again. The kids are calling it uh, open time optimization. Um, and, but, you know, the there isn't an RFP uh, requirements document that we have that say, 
can you, you know, do you have integrations with Movable Inc? How many integrations with Movable Inc? So, you know, I just want to say, you know, you, you've done a lot of service for the industry. I know there's now a lot of competitors have driven, have come around you. Uh, and Audience Point Pulse Company is another example of a third party vendor doing something first and yep. then ESP is following by, by buying or building. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I think that's very healthy for our industry because um, it, it'll be the, you know, this vendors always are trying to figure out what's going to capture who they think at that time may be their audience. And oftentimes that's a C-suite. Yep. Third parties focus on the practitioner. And I think that's, that's the huge value that, that companies like Audience Point and Movable Link bring to our industry. It's lifeblood of it. And I just, again, I, I, there's no question here. It's my just, rambling. Just keep talking. You know what I mean? You know, I, more. Just keep you know, talking. Thank you. That's what we you want. Know, we got, we, we, the whole industry owes companies like Movable Inc. A, a, a you know level and, of gratitude and audience for, point gratitude and audience point too. Send, uh, send the thank you notes. We and, and, we appreciate know, them again for 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 keeping innovation alive. So thank you. Well, two two things you mentioned. Um, one, it strikes me as you know we we still think of ourselves as the underdog as a smaller company and. It's only this is the first conversation we're in that I'm realizing, wow, maybe there is a role we're playing and maybe we could be more conscious and intentional about it. And we're representing not just our company. So I would love feedback for from either of you or any of our listeners. If there's things that we could be doing to help move our industry forward, I'd love to hear them and uh, see, you know, yeah, how, can, well, how can we do our let's part. Let's connect offline from here because uh, I've, I've been kind of feeling similar things. And, uh, you know, it's going to be sort of people who've been in the industry for a little while who can, 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 do, can do some of that, some of our connections, relationships, that kind of stuff. So we'll connect offline and see if there's a, a there there. Yeah. And then my final thought on this is um, things aren't always, always what they seem on the surface. You know, some companies seem to be killing it, but it's, there's deep problems underneath. Some are sleepers. You have no idea that they're doing well and they're like taking off. And the, I, I think the secret is there's a, we always try to come up with trite ways of describing what a company is and what they're right. doing. And the secret can really be underneath. And for us, embracing our customers and thinking we're this thing over here when we started eight years ago and ending up at a different place has been such an interesting transformation to have seen. And, um, you know, and they continue to lead us, right? We have research teams constantly talking to our customers. Uh, we have feedback loops from our yeah. client services teams. And they're, they're pointing to things that are real challenges and problems for them. And it's like, wow, there's, there's still a whole lot more we could be doing to help marketers uh, hone their craft and serve their customers. Mm -hmm. I, I thought this is when you were going to sort of share, you know, you, you're talking about some companies look really good on the outside, but underneath they're falling apart. I was like, <laughs> is this where he's sharing? Oh my <laughs> Lord. This is like the biggest get we've ever had, Marion. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I will, I will share. Uh, we had, the, the, the last three quarters in the company were record breaking uh, for the company. So COVID, you know, it was a crazy year and hopefully everyone's doing okay. But that's, that's been the surprising bounce back uh, yeah. that we've seen where right, they were record breaking quarters for us. And that that's continuing. And it's like, wow, we have to, uh, we're just trying to hire quickly enough. I think we've hired 120 people since the start of the year. Wow. Well, I'm glad, to well, I'm glad at least somebody did well during 2020. I can say email connect was that wasn't a, wasn't a banner near year for us. 2020. 2021 is looking better. So we're happy well, about that. Um, are we doing a lightning round today, Marriott, or no lightning no, round? No, I think we're retiring that. We're retiring. I think it, it may be time. Sorry. I think it's run its course. It's run its course. Vivek, it has been fantastic to reconnect through this. Again, I think let's connect outside of this on what that could, would, should look like in terms of industry. And then uh, folks want to get in touch with you, I'm assuming social channels, connecting through Movable Link, maybe they have something they wanted to share back with you. You're certainly open to that. Yeah, um, on Twitter, I'm Viv Sharma. Also easy to vsharma at movableinc.com. Not cool. very hard to guess. And I uh, would love to hear from you. Cool, that's great. Well, I appreciate you coming on today. Appreciate, it was, it was great to hear from your perspective, yeah. um, you know, all about what's going on with Apple and, and what's going on in the industry. So again, we thank you. Great talking to you. Rock and roll, awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you, Chris and Paul. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we're back. We're back with producer David. Yeah. And look, where are you today, uh, David? Uh, I'm I'm working on the first floor today. Uh, Got I it. Need to, I could use a change of scenery, but 
but it's a little dank down here. I reached for my mouse earlier and, and I ended up picking up a mouse. A real mouse, yeah, yeah, that's. Most people would say you're, it looks like you're in the basement. I, I, that doesn't look like any first floor, uh, uh, in, unless you're in like a castle. Uh, well, no, it's just uh, we have an unfinished first floor. Um, <laughs> which which happens to be underground, like everyone else's basement, or? Well, there aren't any windows, so I, I couldn't tell you if we were above or below ground. But uh, oh, David, do you have, are, are, there, are there people in your life that you consider friends, but may have taken you from a, a, a safe and normal situation uh I, I, whatever do you mean you, surely you're yeah. not referring to to tony and the gang that gave me a ride in that unmarked van that one time yeah it's called stockholm syndrome david and it's it's the idea that you would relate with your kidnappers they're not your friends david they've stolen you i am best friends with my captors no rescue needed ha 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 oh my goodness well let's you know i think let's before we get into just how hilarious i am because you know uh i do want to give a shout out to vivek uh way funnier than both of us chris honestly uh like he brought some quips i know i see your face and you disagree but honestly when he was like i see you're in your prison cell or whatever it was i was like crap i don't have a response to that well uh, he did but but uh, again you know the it, it, it's a crime, the lack of thought you give into what's behind you. you know, producer David gives a ton of thought to it and always comes up with something unique yeah. like where, he, where, he sets, where he sets up his computer. Yeah, um, that's true. That is I'm always in my office that. straightening up beforehand. Um, and you just sort of wherever your feet have taken you that I day. Know. And it's that time and... and uh, you know, do you I, think I, I guess this is holding me back professionally, Chris. I mean, do you feel like do you feel like I do next level stuff if if I was more concerned with uh, the background behind me in my in my Zoom? Pretty sure you'd be doing some TED talks if you spent a little more time <laughs> thinking about that. Yeah. Oh man, that's 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 pretty awesome. Anyway, well, but to bring it back to Vivek, I thought um, it was really awesome that he was willing to sort of be that transparent about some things. Uh, yeah. around uh i mean we we didn't pull back we asked some hard questions how is your I, business going to deal with these things and and uh, yeah and uh and and he he took it and uh gave thoughtful answers he sure did he sure did and and, and again i don't think that's easy to do and so kudos to him for for doing yeah. that no we're glad he came on the program and uh again um was was open forthright and insightful did you watch? You didn't think I was any... scripted coming up with that kind of stuff. I know. Well, uh, honestly, most of the time when your mouth opens, we have we get honestly comments on a near weekly basis. There's no way Chris is coming up with this on the fly. He's got to be scripted. I mean, honestly, Chris, I don't know that you see the amount of email coming to emailgeekscopy at gmail.com saying there's no way Chris is legitimate. He can't be. He's better, he's bigger than life. That's what they're saying. But you know what? And and to my fans, I appreciate that. Uh, there is not a Chiron here. Oh, that's what they have in the news. There, there's not a teleprompter here. But yeah, actually, well. one of the things I wanted to, to, to talk about was I had planned to announce in this post show that we were retiring the lightning round. Instead, you forced me to do it in the middle of a guest interview. Um, what do you have to say for yourself? Man, I'm really sorry, Chris. I didn't, I didn't realize I was stealing your thunder. It was going to be a big announcement, but yeah, yeah, I think you know we're professionals, all of us, and I think you, when a bit has run to, its course, I think when a bit you, has run its course, no. we should say we're what not getting any more the, out of this. What do you say to the people who say, "But Chris, I plan my week around your lightning round, and your lack of lightning round disappoints me." What do you say to those people, Chris? Well, you know what, folks, if if you want the lightning round back, there's one way to do it. Get those that? calls and emails into producer David and into uh, emailgeeks at gmail.com, emailgeekscopy, whatever. Let us I'm know. Wor I'm worried that, that the cell phone networks will be able to handle the call volume for David on this particular topic, Chris. 
And so uh, you want to stress test the network, put that out there. You know what I mean? Can, can this stand up to the call volume? Ask if people want the lightning round. People, all right. Well, there you have it. David, people what do you hear? Round. What do you hear from, what are you hearing organically from people right now about the lightning round, David? Well, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to know exactly what people are tuning in for, but I do know that we have at least a few million diehard fans that are listening to the show uh, solely for the lightning round. They skip ahead. Uh, so they skip the interview, they skip the pre and post show, just that lightning round. They just, they love the, the thrill of the lightning. Hey, Chris, I'm going to, I'm going to put it on par with this. When you decided to stop doing musical theater, when you stopped being Cameron Birdie for Bye Bye Birdie, you had a, a, a trove of fans who that was their last day of joy. You know what I mean? I didn't leave the theater after being Conrad Birdie. What I did was I took a dramatic turn in a very depressing stage play called Dark of the Moon, where there's a rape, there's a, a, a many, many disturbing things. I kid you not. I kid you not. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I kid you not. And, and my fan base apparently didn't like to see me in a dramatic role. I mean, it would be like Tom Hanks going from immediately from bachelor party to splash uh, to what splash no that's a kind of one comedic turn after another no oh, my, like, i get it i'm sorry you mean like from from a bachelor party to something like uh the volunteers no no um how about something like from bachelor party to saw one two or three Okay, yeah, yeah, I can see that. I, I can see Tom Hanks being really good in Saw, honestly. If, well, and, and, I, I mean, David, correct me if I'm wrong. If Tom Hanks is in Saw, that's a different movie. He's a national treasure. You know what I mean? Well, you know, speaking of movies and national treasures, um, did you see the, the turn that Vince Vaughn took in his recent movie um, where he plays a serial killer who, who changed his place with a high school girl one of those body switcheroo things. And he goes from being the serial killer in the movie to being a girl with a serial killer inside. Well, no, a guy with, be, with a teenage girl inside of him. It's a classic comedic turn, but there's a dark side to, to, um, I mean, to uh, Vince that I'd love to talk to him about on the show. I'd love to talk about the program. You know, how much of a stretch was it to go from being a legit evil mass right. murderer to a high school girl? Oh, you know, I would like to see that too. I'd also love to see the juxtaposition of that interview with Jamie Lee Curtis as she described that same exact body switch that took place in 2003 in the movie Freaky Friday, where uh, she switches places with her daughter and her daughter has to put on the professional antics at work. I'd love to see those two things side by side, Chris. Well, th there are other movies. There was a movie where uh, I think, believe Jason Bateman also switches with his son. Uh, Producer David United, can you remember the name of that movie? Uh, the Change Up with, with Ryan Reynolds, is that right? No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's nothing. No, it's where J Jason Bateman switches with his son and, you know, hilarity ensues, just like Freaky Friday. This is not a new... You know, honestly, that's the standard by which all body switch movies, I think, are probably gauged is... Uh, Freaky Friday, Chris. So I, I, you so know, to sure. your point, I'd love to see, I'd love to hear what Vince Vaughn has to say about his theatrical chops. You know, being that we're all in the theater here, Chris. You know what I mean? You know, the change up. I'm looking at. I'm just doing a little bit of. Oh wow! You know what, producer David is right. Why didn't you push back? <laughs> I'm sorry. I know my place. You're, yeah, I mean, Chris, like he's told me before how intimidated he is around you. Mm -hmm. And you put him in that position where you say you're wrong publicly in front of this huge worldwide fan base that we have. What is he to do? His, his idol calls him out. What is he, is, what's he, uh, seriously, how should he respond to that, Chris? Well, I, I'd like to see a little more pushback. Um, Oh, and, and uh, the Vince Vaughn movie is called Freaky. I guess an homage to Freaky Friday. Yeah, probably it is, honestly. I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis set the bar high in that movie. So, it'll be, you know, again, I'll be curious to see what Vince 
and Vince can do to live up to that. Well, so we'd love to. So Vince, again, we're open invitation to come on the program whenever you want uh, to discuss we're, anything you want. Your recent we'll probably your location. well, and and by anything you want, basically again, Jamie Lee Curtis versus Vince Vaughn, and who, who wore it better? I mean, that's that's really going to be the main focus. Yeah, but we'd also like like to hear about his 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 recent home purchase in Lake Forest, Illinois. Right. Uh, how he's liking moving back to his hometown. Um, and uh, being the villain in Starsky and Hutch, Huggy Bear. Was, yeah, see, that was though, though. I still think his his breakout role had to be Wedding rounders. Crashers. No, no, it was Rounders. No, 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 his breakout your money, role. Chris, you're married. Your money, your money, and what makes you so money, Chris, is that you don't even know that you're money. Which movie are you talking about? Rounders. Wasn't that his movie? David? No, you're talking about no, you're talking no talking about swingers, you mean? Swingers, uh, yeah. Oh, you're uh, yeah, you're right. It was swingers. John Favreau. And uh yeah. I don't need to look it up. Vince Vaughn and no, he was good in that movie, but but I'm telling you. No, he was money in that movie, Chris. Wedding crashers. He was wedding money. crashers. Number though though he also played very good roles in, in uh old school. And, oh uh, yeah, no, no. But he, to say that his breakout role was not swingers is is wrong. It that was his. That was that was when people were like, he's a household name. No, that was that was an art house movie. David, no, no. David, what do you, do you want to weigh in here, David? Uh, as a cinema file, I, I I think they were the two biggest steps in his career. <laughs> You know, very safe answer for producer between two. Well, that's because he's intimidated by you, Mary. By you? No, he's intimidated by you and your massive what is, what ego am I? and your temper tantrum. You're the Ellen DeGeneres of the podcast world. The way you treat our staff, it's a very well-kept I'm, secret. I'm but... the Ellen DeGeneres of the podcast world. It's <laughs> absolutely true. And David, the first floor here, This is he's he was gentle when he called me Tony earlier. David, we're going to need more from you. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, this part of the. Um, anyway, thanks for tuning in to Ellen DeGeneres today. I appreciate yeah, all yeah. you guys <laughs> everything. And, Man, we, uh, we, we, uh, will you dance us out, Paul? I certainly will, Chris. All right, folks. We'll see you again soon with, at Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. Thanks Thank for uh, tuning in.